Hello. Hola, or should I say. <laughs> yeah. I ain't in New York today, just so you guys know that. I'm actually in Costa Rica. Huh? If you can't tell, pura vida, baby. Yeah. Sorry about that. I got the little hat on, a little touristy hat. It's a like pineapple. Wearing sunglasses. That's comedy. Anyways, uh, today I'm going to be doing a little tour of uh, Costa Rica. I'm going to be bouncing around here in Puerto Viejo, which is on the Caribbean side. I'm going to be da dabbling into uh, San Jose as well, but talking about the history. You guys want shots, drone shots of Costa Rica? Go watch another different video. You know, this is more information. I ain't going to get this history anywhere else. Well, you will, like documentaries and stuff, but you ain't going to get it in a more cinematic way. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Look, I'm going to give you guys a history. It's going to be great. Lucy, how are you doing? Pura vida is right. So, you know, by the way, pura vida is like the little saying here. It means like take it easy. And they say it after everything. And it basically translates into pure life, like completely and totally life, you know. But that's all it's really uh, about, you know, having pura vida, you know. Uh, sorry, I keep doing this. Uh, you know, I don't know why, but uh, it's cool, right? It's cool, right, Lucy? Very, very cool. Thanks. Anyways, before we get into all that, guys, check out the Patreon. There's some extras on there. I do little podcasts, extra videos. Uh, that's how I find these things. Very important. Uh, please. Also, too. Uh, just so you guys know, I mean, I'm here for work with Lucy, uh, so that's kind of nice. So I, I thought I'd take advantage and, uh, you know, do a little video, so that's pretty cool. Uh, anyways, also, too, like and subscribe to the video. If you watch more than one of these, that helps out. Uh, but aside from that, we're going to be bouncing around the country. We're going to go into San Jose. We're going to be going around here in Puerto Viejo on the Caribbean side, telling you the history, the development, as briefly as I can. This ain't a college course, all right? So chill out on the comments, all that stuff, trying to give you guys the basics. Uh, you know, if there are any PhDs out there, you know, Costa Rican history PhDs, Take it easy, all right? Pura vida. Anyways, uh, what do you think, Lucy? Should we just get going? Yes. I think I covered everything. That was pretty concise. Yes. All right, well, then let's go. I'm getting, getting uh, anxious and antsy. Let's do it. <sighs> all right. Now, I'm here in uh, Puerto Viejo, which is a great little town on the Caribbean coast to tell you about how the beginnings of this whole place started. So it's not unlike this place in 1502 where Christopher Columbus first landed in a place called Limón just to the north of us. Those freaky Spanish always looking for gold, you know what I mean. Anyways, uh, later on they tried to develop the encomienda system, which is what they were doing in other parts of Central America where they give a lot of land to Spanish people and try to give them you know, all control over all the slaves and stuff on that land. Didn't take hold here because the indigenous population that was here before was already kind of decimated by disease. In fact, by 1600, there were like, I don't know, like 10,000, I think, uh, indigenous from the hundreds of thousands that existed before Columbus got here. They'd been decimated by smallpox and different diseases. Uh, it was a total mess. And on top of it, they weren't united under one group. They were actually different cacicascos, which is what they were called, which are like chieftainships. And they were spread out all over. In fact, one of the big ones was the Nicoya over in the Pacific Northwest. Today, there are different, eight different major tribes recognized by Costa Rica. Uh, there are reserves and all that stuff today. They actually passed a law in 1977 to kind of go back on all the land they took from them. It's a whole mess, like it is in the United States as well. But uh, that's what they kind of arrived to. And because of that, they weren't able to enslave the people as easily as they were in other parts of Central America. Anyways, as the 1700s takes hold, you have more peasant agriculture. And it starts to slowly shift to the central of the country because uh, that's where the highlands are. That's where coffee, tobacco, all that stuff grew more easily. So the capital that they'd established in a place called Cartago starts to get replaced by those cities in the center. Now, by the end of the 1700s, early 1800s, you have other things happening. In fact, Napoleon invades the Iberian Peninsula in the early 1800s, right? Okay, stay with me, all right? You also had the Bourbon dynasty take hold in Spain, which changed things from the previous dynasty. What they started doing is taxing their colonies a little more heavily. They started to give preference to the Spanish blood people there as opposed to the local elites. That pissed people off. So they revolted. The, Span the Mexican War of Independence starts uh, in 1810, ends in 1821 with the independence of Central America pretty much. And it's about that time that this whole Central American province is formed, kind of a whole massive country, right? At the end of it, there was too much infighting, all that stuff. Costa Rica breaks off 1848 and starts its own country. Ah, look at that. In fact, they still had their own infighting over which city would be in charge. Uh, in fact, it started to slowly shift towards San Jose uh, around that time as well, but it was 1848 that Costa Rica became its own country, even though 1821 was when it got its independence from Spain. Whew, that's a lot of, that's a lot of coverage there, Lucy. What do you think? Amazing. Did that make sense? I say we go get a maracuya juice, uh, and uh, instead of just talking to the camera, everyone's looking at me like I'm a freak for having a camera and getting my feet wet, but uh, you know what? It doesn't matter. You have any questions, Lucy? Tell people where you are exactly. 
I did. I said we're in Puerto Viejo. Punta Uva. Well, we're at Punta Uva Beach right nearby. Uh, pretty cool beach. We uh, went snorkeling earlier. Pretty cool. And we got to see some, you know, we saw, we saw Nemo's best friend. We saw some parrots flying around. Uh, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, anyways, we're going to talk about that a little later. We can't get ahead of ourselves. Should we keep moving, Lucy? Let's do it. Let's do it. This yeah. way, right? Uh, no, this way. Oh. Yeah, this way. As Central America became more apparently important, especially as a transit point from the Atlantic to the Pacific side and for its resources, guess who got more involved? The stinking Americans, los gringos. Anyways, uh, one of the ways they got involved was through what was called filibustering. And uh, this one guy named William Walker actually made a trip to Nicaragua to kind of take part in the Civil War there. Uh, he actually sided with the uh, liberals, the Democrats in León versus the conservatives in Granada, which were the legitimists. He actually basically took a side. He brought a bunch of mercenaries, hundreds of them, and took a side in this war that wasn't really his because he wanted to establish a slave-holding stronghold in, the, uh, in Central America. Kind of messed up. He wanted to kind of, it to be an extension of the Confederacy. And he actually covered some ground, got in with the Democratic Party, and actually became the president of Nicaragua uh, briefly. Uh, in just a span of a few years. Obviously, this kind of bothered people in Central America, including Costa Rica. Uh, this man named Juan Rafael Mora, who was the actual leader here in Costa Rica, was like, we got to do something. So he calls together a militia, and they basically go to fight. Uh, they're beaten at the beginning, uh, and they're pushed back here to, uh, to Costa Rica, but then they kind of come back and make another push when, uh, when Walker tried to kind of slowly invade Costa Rica itself, and he pushes them all the way back to the town of Rivas in Nicaragua. Yeah, no big deal. It's a little bit of an accent there, you know, it's kind of nice. Uh, so he pushes them back, and they actually take, uh, they take refuge in a stronghold there. Uh, he pushes them in there and he's like, oh, well, this is how we're going to beat them. We're going to burn down this place while they're inside. Problem was they were picking people off from the windows and everything, uh, so no one could get close enough. People died trying to burn it down. Finally, the mil military was like, hey, does anyone want to volunteer to try to burn this place down? And the man behind me on this statue, Juan Santa Maria, volunteered. 25-year-old kid, almost certain death, uh, but he was going to sacrifice his life basically for the cause. He makes it all the way to the stronghold and he burns it down and they win the battle. Uh, yeah, interestingly enough, uh, he also, he also uh, before he went in, he said the only request he had was that they take care of his mother. That's a beautiful uh, Latino tradition. You gotta be a, you gotta be a mama's boy, baby. That's uh, that's what you gotta do. You gotta take care of mama. So he did that, and uh, he died in the process. He became a national hero, and they have this statue here of him in Alajuela, which is where he was from, uh, and uh, this is Juan Santa Maria Park. Uh, but an interesting kind of role that he played, you know, he had to sacrifice himself to kind of beat back the people who were trying to get involved in the politics and in the uh, economies here in uh, Central America all the way back in the 1800s. I mean, it never really stopped uh, from when, you know, the first explorers and whatnot came here. So just another interesting example of how it happened. But as the 1800s developed, so did the country in other different ways. And we'll talk about that as we go. Any questions, Lucy? How was that? That was amazing. Is there anything that you have that you're curious about? Wow, that you're really, that's really good. That was a really good uh, save. Uh, okay, well, that's pretty much the story of Juan Santa Maria, the national hero here in Costa Rica. Let's keep moving. From the years 1850 to 1890, coffee actually accounted for 90% of Costa Rica's exports. Here in the Central Valley, which is where San Jose and many of the major cities are located, is where most of the coffee was actually grown. Because of that coffee, because of the money coming in, culture started expanding, baby. It was a really beautiful thing. You know, novelists start writing, and then things like this behind me get built. This is El Teatro Nacional, which was built in 1897, the National Theater, for those of you guys who don't understand that very complicated Spanish. Uh, it actually opened in 1897 with the production of Faust uh, by Goethe. The German, uh, you know, you know that guy, right, Lucy? Good to. Good to. Uh, so, uh, what built up to this was uh, a few things. First of all, obviously, coffee uh, took off and started to get the country more sophisticated. But another big thing was the railway, the railway that connected this area here to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, coffee was very important to the country, but one of the things that kept it from booming 
was its access to its markets, especially in Europe. So for example, in Europe, you had a lot of the people who were buying the coffee. So initially they were taking it by ox cart over to the Pacific Ocean and going all the way around South America. It was like a trip of five months. By creating a railway to the Caribbean side, they cut it down to five weeks, uh, about six weeks uh, of a trip. So it's very short. Uh, that's what they did. So it starts in 1870, 1871. This man named Tomas Guardia, it's a very nice name, <laughs> you know, uh, he's actually the president and he signs a deal with a man named, well, a family, uh, but uh, we'll get to that in a second, a man named Henry Miggs, who was the uncle of a guy named Minor C. Keith, Minor Cooper Keith. Uh, so this guy Miggs, Henry Keith, and Minor Cooper Keith start a railway service. This guy Miggs had already created one in the Andes, much bigger fish to fry there, so he kind of gave it to his nephews, Henry and Minor, right? So they are going to build this railway. They were in their early 20s, and they were gonna build this railway from here in San Jose and the, and the surrounding areas all the way to the Caribbean side. Needless to say, it was a total disaster because they were going through the jungle. There was problems with disease, the, the humidity, all these things. No, first of all, no one from Costa Rica actually wanted to work that. He had to bring in people from outside. One of the people he brought in uh, was uh, criminals from New Orleans, actually. He brought in like 700 criminals. They almost all died, 25 were left. Big problem. Another group he tried to bring in and actually was more successful were the Jamaicans. The Jamaicans were actually, and, the, and actually the Caribbean people were the ones who built the railroad, uh, the actual railroad, the railroad, because they were actually a little more, uh, I guess, used to the, the weather and they were a little uh, more resilient. So they, he brought those people over as well. Another problem he was having was funding it. Uh, and one of the ways he funded it was by developing the banana, which at the time was a very new fruit. Keep in mind, this is in the, you know, 1870s, 1880s, the banana was a very exotic thing, believe it or not. Everyone now just knows the banana is everything, but it was one of those fruits that you see in Central America, see in other parts of the world, and you just never really eat. But he helped kind of, uh, kind of bring it to the United States. And one of the things he did was he took the land that they granted him for the railroad, and along the sides of it, he started cultivating bananas, uh, interestingly enough. So, uh, by the way, Minor Cooper Keith's uh, brothers, two of them, died building this railroad, including Henry, so he kind of took over. So a couple things happened for uh, Minor Keith while he was here. He met the daughter of the former president of Costa Rica, and he married her. So he was kind of an eligible bachelor. He marries the daughter of a former president. Pretty cool. Also, too, he was able to negotiate with the government because the government actually uh, needed this railway done. And one of the things they did, because they didn't have money to pay him, was they gave him land. They gave him 800,000 acres. That's a lot. That's like 7% of the actual land of the whole country uh, at the time. So it was a big deal. And you know what he did with it was he started to use it for uh, farming. And no, uh, you know, in 1890, the actual railway was finished, but he knew what he was doing. And he actually formed United Fruit Company with a man named Andrew Preston in Boston. Uh, and they created the United Fruit Company. And it was actually the beginning of this powerhouse. United Fruit Company by itself caused, you know, coups, it, it, it manipulated governments, manipulated markets in Central America. It was one of the biggest problems, I guess, coming from the United States. It ended up operating in five different Latin American countries and Jamaica. It had over a quarter of a million acres just for this company. It was a really huge deal. That's kind of how it all went down. And when the train was finished, it caused obviously a huge boom in coffee production and also diversification. You had bananas and early on you had other things as well. You had different minerals, you had uh, textiles, all these diversified things. Now that you had ways to transport it, started to pop up in the early 1900s. So you had culture in the late 1800s and early 1900s popping up here in Costa Rica. Pretty cool, the actual railway, the Atlantic Railway uh, of Costa Rica. Kind of interesting, right, Lucy? Yeah. Did that make sense? I feel like I'm just rambling, huh? Fruit is dangerous. Fruit is dangerous. A bunch of fruits running around in here. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's, that's not what I meant. You know what I mean. Anyways, uh, yeah, pretty cool. All right, let's go to the next spot. So Costa Rica has actually benefited from pretty peaceful uh, times in Latin America compared to other countries here. Uh, in fact, I'm standing in front of what used to be a fortress that was built in 1917. It's now the uh, National Museum, but it was built when there was one coup d'etat in 1917. It was short-lived, a, a man named Tinoco, who was only there for a couple of years before being pushed back out. But it also still holds the scars from another uh, violent uh, period, and that was in 1948. So what happened was, 
1948, there was a uh, election, right? Between this guy Ulate and this guy Calderon. Ulate wins, right? But the problem is the Congress was pro Calderon. So they basically said, no, nah, we're gonna nullify your results. And it was a standoff. So this guy behind me named Jose Figueres comes in and he basically raises an army of mercenaries. Uh, actually, a lot of them using El Pacto del Caribe, which was a pact with a lot of Caribbean countries that he basically promised, if you guys give me some, some military, I'll go in, I'll take over Costa Rica, and then I'll help you guys rid, get rid of all your tyrants. Uh, so they gave him some, some uh, military. So he comes in and basically starts a civil war in 1948, right? Eventually it gets so bloody, this is five weeks, uh, 2,000 people die. And he makes a pact, he makes a compromise with Ulate, uh, basically saying, all right, look, man, I promise not to outlaw communism. Uh, I promise to not uh, persecute uh, opposition forces and uh, all this stuff. And they say, okay, fine, ceasefire. So he gets in power. Uh, Figueres gets in power and immediately he outlaws communism. Immediately he, he rids the government of all the, uh, you know, of all the opposition forces, but he does get, he does actually implement universal suffrage. Ah, what a concept. And most importantly, he abolishes the military, which is still to this day abolished in Costa Rica. And one of the reasons why it's been stable since 1948. Uh, so this plaza we're in right now, in front of this fort, is actually called the Plaza de la Democracia, which is the Democ Democracy Plaza, but also uh, it honors the abolition of the military, which here in Costa Rica is obviously a very big deal and makes it very unique among Latin America. I don't know if you know this, there's been some instability in Latin America, and because there's no military here, they, they have uh, actually been spared some of it. Uh, so this plaza is actually commemorating that. Kind of cool. Uh, you know, that's something, that's something that I guess coming from the United States you could never even imagine. Uh, but yeah, here there is no military, so that's kind of interesting. What do you think of that story, Lucy? I think it's amazing. You think I told it well? Yes. Yeah, cool. It's Switzerland. That's right, it is a Switzerland in Central America. That's actually an essay, a very famous essay from the 1930s about, all the way from back then even, they're talking about um, Costa Rica that way as well. Uh, you know, being very neutral throughout its history, kind of trying to avoid a lot of the problems that that brings. And that stability has also led to lots of investment, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Anyways, uh, all right, let's keep moving. I said let's keep moving. Hey, stop it. That's pretty cool, right? Hmm. Okay, so the Second Republic of Costa Rica is established after the whole thing in 1948, which we already talked about. By the way, I'm back in uh, Puerto Viejo. Look at that, bouncing around. By the way, Puerto Viejo is a little town on the uh, Caribbean coast, which is, uh, you know, big uh, tourism is to kind of starting to blow up in Costa Rica. And that's been a shift, actually, and we'll talk about that in a second. But after the Second Republic was actually set up in 1949, you started to have insane growth. So from 1950 to 1970, you had like populations more than doubled. Uh, money starts to go into the private sector from public hands. They call it an entrepreneur state. Uh, money starts flowing from the state to people to start businesses. A lot of those foreign companies actually. Um, however, this uh, is not good enough to say for the peasantry. It's not good for uh, people who, who relied on subsistence farming, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, and uh, big companies start taking land as well. Uh, now, there is a backlash. In fact, in 1970, there's a famous uh, protest called the Alcoa No protest. Alcoa is a big, humongous uh, company, uh, American company, uh, I believe, an aluminum company that was given, it was going to be given thousands and thousands of public land by the government. And people said, no, we don't want to do that. There was a big, big fight in, uh, in the city. There's actually, you know, people were arrested, a big mess. But eventually, they pushed, uh, they pushed the government to deny that, that uh, I guess, giveaway. So there is a back and forth. Uh, today, there's been a big shift to tourism uh, as well in the uh, country because before it was, you know, coffee, chocolate, things like that. And now tourism is a big hand. And you can see it in neighborhoods like this. This is a really, really cool little place, actually. Uh, you should check it out. There was actually a really big uh, financial crisis in the 1980s. And, and at that time, Costa Rica started out to take out more loans in places like the World Bank, IMF. And when you get loans like that as a small country, they push you for uh, towards doing more neoliberal adjustments, right? Which means more privatization, less public sector, uh, you know, companies and industries, and that could be a problem. Uh, they also push more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, credit, opening the gates to foreign companies and things like that. So 
In fact, in 1995, there was the famous Figueres Calderón Pact, which actually pushed the country to make even more of those neoliberal adjustments, and the country is still reeling. The problem with these things is it opens the country to outside influences, people who are really looking to just maximize their profit on a country and aren't as interested in, let's say, uh, keeping the environment what it is. And this is another important point. Costa Rica is very, very biodiverse. So to give you a little statistics, Costa Rica has 5% of the world's species of any animal, over 500,000 species of animal, and only has 0.03% of the land mass. Yeah, we got to see some of them. We got to see some, you know, I got to see some, you know, green parrots in the wild. You got to see sloths, all kinds of really cool animals here. There's over, uh, over 400,000 uh, species of just insects here, which is pretty wild. Um, so you're a very biodiverse uh, country, and they, those kind of things will go by the wayside as, as when foreign interests start coming into a country. So it's a balance, you know, and in a place like this in Puerto Viejo, they try to strike the balance for now. Hopefully over development, things don't come in and mess it out, mess it up. Let's keep moving. What do you think, Lucy? This is, a, this is pretty good. We kind of covered it all there. I think we're kind of ready to wrap this thing up. Yeah, Puerto Viejo. Right? Puerto Viejo is the best. It's over here on the Caribbean side, which is very different from the Pacific side. Remember, we were talking about already in the center, the highlands kind of took a lot of the control of the country because of all the resources and things that were centered there, things like coffee and cacao and things like that. So there is some cacao out here too, but uh, a lot of the main resources were in the center, the highlands of the country, because that's where the most fertile land was. I'm rambling now. Listen to me ramble. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving. I surprised you. I'm going to surprise. Anyways, uh, guys, we made it to the end of the video. I'm so sorry to tell you that. It's really, really awful. I have to drop it on you like that. But we did learn a lot today. We covered the beginnings of Costa Rica. We covered the pre-beginnings of Costa Rica with the indigenous population, Columbus, the naming. We went into colonial times, agriculture, peasant agriculture, to the development of the railroad, to the tumultuous mid-1900s, to the abolition of the military, to the present day, baby, and to the natural wonder that is this place. So, before we go, guys, just real quick, uh, if you liked it, please check out the Patreon. That's a huge help. Uh, you know, that's how we fund these things. That's how, you know, uh, keep the lights on, as they say. And there's also extras on there, you know, uh, extra videos and recommendations, all that crud. And also, you know, if you don't have it, we get it. You know, no big deal. But if you liked it and you stayed this long, why not just like it and subscribe, baby? That's a big help, too. Uh, but other than that, um, Lucy, what do you think? You think we should just, uh, there's a sloth festival going on. That's pretty cool. We can go check out the Sloth Festival. Yeah. I think uh, I think uh, they have, I think uh, uh, Dua Lipa's playing at the Sloth Festival. That's not true. Uh, but you know, maybe they maybe they dressed up a sloth like Dua Lipa. Who knows? Um, I probably didn't do that. But anyways, guys, that's it. Uh, thanks for checking it out. I'll see you guys later. It's like I just got I just got stung by something. I think. <laughs>